Hey guys, welcome back to Set Streets and Eats. I'm Chris Bauer and this is my 50th episode. And for my 50th episode, it's a big milestone for me, so I thought I'd come back to the place I was born and raised, and that's Flint, Michigan. And I haven't been back in a little while, but I still have family and friends here, so I decided to go ahead and come up for a visit. And uh, this is where I spent the first 25 years of my life, and I'm gonna take you around and show you the Flint that I grew up loving and enjoyed and we're going to try some of the great food, see some of the great sights, and I hope you join me. Let's travel. I'm Chris Bauer, and I am an art slinger. I travel around the U.S. selling artwork at comic and anime conventions, and while I'm there, I like to check out cool sights, eat great food, and see all the places my favorite movies and TV shows are made. Welcome to Sets, Streets, and Eats. So we are at the Flint Farmer's Market. We're gonna go in and check it out. This has actually only been open since 2014. The original Flint Farmer's Market that I grew up going to. For over 100 years, it was right in this building. But once they opened this in 2014, they added all kinds of new stalls and shops, and we're gonna go check it out. So I am here with my daughters, Lily and Kennedy. Say hello. Hi. <clears throat> we are uh, looking around at all the delicious food and we are about to try some items. Do large. Just ordered a cider slushy. Add caramel, you know, because you're not gonna not add caramel to it. Never had one of these. This looks delicious. Oh, this is delightful. I want to try. Oh my goodness, super apple I mean the table. I let go. I mean, it's literally ground up apple, but as a slushy. Mmm. It's got caramel on the bottom. Oh man. Look at the caramel. It sticks to the lid. It's so caramely. Actually, honey would be on that too. I'm quite certain. What are these the crab rangoons? Yep, yep. They look different right now. Oh, they're like folded. Oh, <laughs> little pockets. They look adorable. Or is it? Not your favorite kind, or are they good? So good. Oh, cool. So, sushi cones and crab rangoons went down the hatch. Still working on my cider slush. Next, we're gonna try some cinnamon rolls. Van Gogh inspired local art. So the Flint Farmer's 
market entity has been around since 1905. Awesome. So it's been around for a very long time, but we moved into this building in 2014 in June. So we've been here um, almost seven years. Wow. And so we have about 45 year round vendors downstairs. And then we add additional anywhere from 25 to 50 seasonally outside spring, summer, and fall. Awesome. So good variety of all kinds of stuff. But then additionally, we have this great market tap is up here. They're uh, Michigan beer, wine, and liquor. Awesome. And then um, we also have weddings, actual weddings where people get married downstairs in the market, which is pretty cool. That and is then cool. We have wedding receptions, graduation parties, retirement parties, community fundraisers, all kinds of great stuff. It's really beautiful to be able to have it up here. And then we also have private, um, a large private room downstairs. That is awesome. Up to 200 people. So yeah, pretty That's much perfect. every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from like May Oh, through I'll bet. We have events. That pig's got rabbit ears. Uh, hello. Very good. I think I'm gonna try one of your banana pudding ones. Banana pudding cinnamon roll. Heath bar cinnamon roll. We're gonna try this cinnamon roll. Wow, that's sweet. Yeah, they're going to be very sweet. <laughs> I'm gonna get a little new wafer of mine. You want me to wait? No. Oh, actually, good idea. Awesome. So, Nilla wafer, banana pudding. Wow. I dropped the little wafer. Okay. Oh. The shrapnel everywhere. Oh man. So obviously the cinnamon roll underneath is delicious, but the it's like a mixture. It's like a banana flavored icing. Yeah. And the. It's really interesting. And then it's got a whole bunch of that cinnamon sugar in the middle. This is with a wafer now. Oh man. Oh boy. That is really tasty. Heath bar. Guys, you gotta try these guys. They are crunchy. I'll try one. Super crunchy. Heath Bar Cinnamon Roll. Oh man. Ooh, the toffee's really subtle. Oh, that's good. Ooh, that's got really good flavor. Ooh, that's thick. Come on, cider slushy. No! That's dynamite. That was delicious. Uh, uh. Next time you're in Flint, if you haven't already, come check out the Flint Farmer's Market. You will not be disappointed. So I'm out front of a place called El Topo. El Topo is in Fenton, Michigan, which is about oh, 15 minutes south of Flint. Uh, it's in a little town that's really grown up over the last few years. It's filled with great shopping and awesome food, and this place is no exception. It's made to look like a little Mexican street joint, but it's actually a cover for a speakeasy. So back during Prohibition, back in the 1920s, alcohol was illegal in the US, and places obviously saw that there was a demand for it, and they could charge a premium, so they would open secret bars and the bars always had a front or a business up front to make it seem legit. And this place has a speakeasy in it with a secret entrance and the front or the cover business is no slouch. They actually serve some dynamite food and we're gonna check out both places. We've been open since 2017. Okay, and what was the inspiration for a speakeasy? Uh, our head, we have a, a restaurant here in town called The Laundry and our head barman, John Foley, had been with us for several years and really created a, a great craft culture or craft cocktail culture. And I would say it rival any large city 
and um, John came to us with the idea. And um, this building had been vacant for a little while, and we thought, you know, that'd be something that would be really interesting to do, um, bring a little bit of uh, hipster in defense. Uh, what was the uh, the decision to have a this like a Mexican street food place as the cover restaurant? You know, we weren't exactly sure what we wanted the cover to be, but we wanted it to be very much different from what's in the back. And you'll see when you go back there that hopefully we achieve that. This is, you know, bright colors. Yeah. Um, and just a really good vibe and a really good feel. And who doesn't like a good taco? Uh, we're gonna eat here. Uh, sit right here. That'll work. Oh, okay, cool. So. Mexican Coke's so good. Let me know. So what, is, diet what was it called? I'm sorry. Oh, it's the quesadilla de Preco. Um, basically, you take these small um, slices. So I've known Matt for about 35 years. Actually, it might be more than 35 years for me. Because I remember meeting you when you were a baby and I was like five or six. I don't remember it. I know you don't. You were time. literally in a crib. It's been a lifetime. Mm-hmm. It has been a lifetime. Matt lived in California until a couple years ago. Well, what what age did you move to, from here to California? Well, I moved in uh, 2007. Okay. So you were already... God, 2007 was so long ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, so you were in your 20s. I was going to say, you were already 30. No, yeah. no, 07 I was... was... Like, I was either 26 or 27. Yeah. I think it was 27. And then 26. you guys were there for 12 years? 11. 11 years? 11, yeah. I moved back here. So since you've moved back, being gone for over a decade, how has the Flint area changed in relation to you coming back? Like, what's different about it? Oh, wow. Uh, places like this weren't around when I lived here before. Yeah, no kidding. We never had a place like this. So downtown Flint is open, which uh, wasn't when I moved. Right. So. That's true. When I moved, Flint, there was like very few businesses that were still open. Now they've got all kinds of new businesses down there. And restaurants too. Tons of restaurants. This has got pulled pork, um, queso, queso or uh, pico de gallo, and some kind of like a, a cream sauce. Not sour cream, but something else. Um, man, that's, that's dynamite. It's also between two flour tortillas that are uh, stuck together with cheese, pepper jack cheese. This is really good. It's kind of like a, like a pulled pork with. No. Yeah. Got some. Uh, are those uh, mangoes? And, uh, yeah. Is it a fruit? Okay. Is yeah. there a mango? Yep. Mango. Oh man. And uh, on a corn shell. Mm-hmm. It is good. <clears throat> All right. I'm gonna try these. Uh, she said what they were, but I'm never gonna get it right. I'm gonna put lots of dip in it. It's. Uh, so if you've ever had like a roast beef sandwich, this is like the Mexican equivalent of it. It's just like a cup of au jus, which is not au jus at all, but it's very juicy. And these are pieces of taco. All right. Oh, man. That's good. That is really good. That is dynamite. Oh. Oh, that's tasty. That was delicious. So we are going to finish up here, and we are going to head to the other business that is on the premises. So we are at the back of El Topo, which by the way stands for mole or the mole or the spy, I believe in Spanish. Um, anyway, this 
building, or this room, building, it is another building, called the Relief, the Relief and Resource Company. It's a very nonsense name for a bar. You know, it keeps it on the down low. But it's a speakeasy, and I'm a smart man. I brought someone who doesn't drink to a bar, so I get to try everything. That's cool. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. That's cool, chat. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Cheers. Oh wow, that reminds me of uh, that beer, the Shandy Tea, it's like a summer fresh like lemon zesty drink, but he's right, it's not super sweet, it's got like a lot of liquor in it. My background is primarily bar, Ooh. yeah, I started, um, I started working behind bars when I was 20. Oh, okay. Kind of moved back to my hometown, which is yep. which is Fenton, and started working at the laundry. Uh, okay. As they went from um, kind of bistro service to to full restaurant okay. service. All right. So I um, I quickly became heavily involved with the, sure. the, the nascent bar program there. The whiskey program is important to us. Okay. So um, to have a, a a big whiskey program was something that we wanted to do. We want to be representative of both American whiskey and world whiskey, UK whiskey, sure. where most big programs are very bourbon heavy. Yeah, they are. So, you know, you, you get to a situation where you're trying to really build a program in a library right. and the bottles tend to accumulate. We want to emphasize um, old ingredients, yeah. ancient ingredients. Uh, when we want a flavor, we want the best possible way to get that flavor. Yeah. And also, like, I think it's fair to say that Maybe not as much now, maybe 80 to 90% of the back bars in America look identical. So this is built to run contrary to that, to show you oh, all the totally other is. things that you can that you can possibly have access to. And then, you know, the those... sheer amount of it gets my attention as soon as I walked in. Oh yeah, you know, you got different releases of different whiskey. You've got our barrel picks. You know, if you see a couple different Buffalo Traces up there, it's because we do private barrel picks. Sure. Um, now what's involved in a private barrel pick? Well, so like a great many bourbons that you drink, that you enjoy are, blended from multiple barrels. Okay, That's sure. why single barrel bourbon is such a such a big deal right, right now. So um, what's involved is either physically going to a distillery right. and standing in a room with four or five barrels yeah. and tasting them and selecting one or having the distillery send those samples up right, okay. to you and doing the same thing, tasting through them by committee and saying, okay, this is the one that we really want. We're gonna buy this, and then and you're then, able to select the flavor of that. And then they, like this one and then they bottle it for us, and it's we, we're the only ones who get it. Oh, that's awesome! It's like a signature whiskey. Sort of, yeah. And then it runs out, and you do it again. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so these cocktails were delicious. I'm glad I have a DD. I may or may not be feeling these pretty well. Um, overall experience was amazing. Uh, this place is really cool. I love the going through the Pringles machine to get here and. They know what they're doing on cocktails, and I highly recommend coming to this speakeasy next time you're here. Check it out.
Stone Museum is quite a staple for Flint, Michigan. It's been around for many, many years. And uh, so it, they, it's under a complete renovation. They completely tore the building down and they're starting fresh. And uh, in the meantime, while they're working on that, because the construction is going to take about two years, they've moved over to the local mall, Cortland Center, and they are now part of one of the anchor stores in the mall. <clears throat> and you can come check out the museum and what they have to offer. Yeah. And Kevin Kurwitz invited Larry, uh, Larry Shram right. and Wayne Funk, who both own 1910 Oldsmobile, or uh, Buick, 1908 Buick, 1910 Buick. And they hadn't started it, so they had to fiddle with it for an hour, just doing all kinds of work in the engine, which is underneath the floor. Oh. Wayne Funk was up at the steering wheel doing this stuff. The third and final crank was all the steam I had. <laughs> No kidding. Ka -chunk, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, ka -chunk. Really? So they got it running, and it was on these uh, skids, on these little four-wheel skids. Sure. Around, so you could wheel it around. Right, right. And we had the tail end of it sticking out the back of the factory one. So it would shoot the exhaust out? <laughs> and it still ran. Isn't that amazing? That's a pretty car. It really is. That's amazing that car could still run. I mean, it is 111 or 112 years old, 113 years old now. Yep. Wow. So William Durant started, he bought Buick from David Dunbar Buick back in 1904. Four years later, Buick got to be such a success that he started General Motors when he bought Oldsmobile as well. So that was all started right here in Flint, Michigan. That's made the car culture in Flint quite epic, as you can imagine. Um, later on, General Motors would move down to Detroit where Ford was. So. While the Sloan Museum is under construction, they've moved some of the cherry pieces of this collection to the mall here. And you can come see them today. Um, the fee, we, my dad lives here in Genesee County, so it's free uh, to come visit the vehicles. But uh, it's a small fee if you're from out of town, so it shouldn't be much. But they're really something to see. The, the car culture here in Flint is very, very something that they're very proud of, as they should be. Uh, cars have influenced the entire world, and without Flint, Michigan's contribution to that legacy, we don't know what car culture would look like today. Behind me is the first production year, 1953 Corvette. This is the original, produced right here in Flint, long before it had moved to the Bowling Green to be produced out of Bowling Green, Kentucky. They built them here in Flint. And this is the 112th Corvette ever made. That's part of the collection, all original. No need to restore it when it looks that good. The Chevette, not the proudest car that Chevrolet ever produced, but boy was it common, it was everywhere. I remember my babysitter growing up had one of those, but it was a diesel, if you can imagine that. A diesel engine Chevette, terrible car. <laughs> This is the second year of the Buick. 1904 is the first year. This is an actual 1905 Model C Buick. I don't know how many exactly are still left. 14. There's 14 Model C, 1905 Model Cs left in the world. This is a very nice one. So behind me is a single seater race car. Um, this car is actually priceless. I'm gonna tell you the history behind it. So the Buick Bug, as they call it, it's the Buick 60 Special, 60 horsepower. Um, back in 1908, Buick started a race team. 
that had the Chevrolet brothers and B uh, Bob Wild B Berman and Lewis Strang, a whole lot of huge names back then in Buick racing, or just in the race car world in general, actually. Anyway, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway was building. It was gonna be opening soon, but they started having races. And in 1910, some of the first races they had, the, Chevrolet, or the Buick team with the Chevrolet brothers, Arthur, Gaston, and Louis Chevrolet, they sat down and decided they were gonna build some single seat race cars. Now back then most of the race cars were double seaters so you could have the mechanic ride on board with the driver. So they built these cars, they built two of them in three weeks leading up to the first races there at uh, Memorial Weekend or May of 1910. And this car is the only one that remains. Louis Chevrolet's is actually missing. It went missing back in 1910, 1911 era. And it's never been seen since. But they still have this one. So this was Bob Wild Berman's car. And, but Louis Chevrolet definitely drove and raced this car as well. And uh, if they ever do find that other one, that one's priceless too. Hey guys. I am out front of a restaurant in Birch Run, Michigan, which is about 20 miles north of Flint. It's called Tony's Restaurant. It's a very unassuming little diner. And this place is known for gigantic portions of food. And their BLT is legendary. And I'm going to go eat one. Let's go check it out. So we are here at Tony's Restaurant. Uh, I got my daughters with me. And then we got my parents who don't want to be on camera. Joke. I just <laughs> my, Mom, my mother doesn't want her soul stolen by her image being on a camera. Anyway, so we're about to order. And now we're twins. I know. You always had better hair than me. But now we have the same. Are you forgetful and annoying? Answer, and yes. I forgot I was annoyed. <laughs> I, I, was annoyed. <laughs> I hope if she's showing the room, she didn't show Tom TJ's room. Like, I had pretty light cheese on it. I thought that was going to have more cheese. <gasps> Look at that, Chris. Oh, you're wrong. Oh, I'm Whoa. seeing it. Let me swirl around. Let me do swirl. Let me do the... Okay, break off. Oh, <laughs> this is one big old BLT. Mmm. Oh. Well, Lost a piece of bacon. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much bacon they go through. Oh, um, I think it's 7,000 pounds. A year? A week. A week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, imagine if you're getting a pound. Yeah. What are they doing, a pallet? Oh, probably more than that. 7,000 pounds of bacon. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Routine! Yeah, that's really good, actually. It's got really good flavor. The gravy's good. I like it, the gravy. So much cheese. It just keeps going and going and going. Oh, it broke. What, was it good, though? Did you like it? pretty good. I really like the cheese. I like the soup. How's the sauce? Oh, pretty good. I gotta say, it's not as good as like how when you make a bag at home. Oh, really? It's okay because it's good, I had like, no idea how that song you played the other day. Well, yeah, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Mm. Yeah, good sauce. Nothing fancy, but it's got a little, got a little zest to it. So I'm stopping eating. I'm done. That was a lot of bacon. Very delicious sandwich with a little much, which I love. I like having bacon left over in my plate that I'm literally making myself eat. So, that's pretty good. 
as you can see, Ryan barely even touched his bacon. That breakfast ended up being gigantic. So uh, everybody should enjoy their meals. This place is fantastic. You come check it out. So I am here at Crossroads Village, here just outside of Flint uh, in Genesee County. Uh, Flint is in Genesee County and Crossroads Village here as well. This is a old 1800s town that was built back in the uh, late 70s, um, basically to give uh, tourists kind of a living history. Uh, they built a whole little town and not really just a facade. They actually built real brick buildings, real homes, real stores, all kinds of really cool places. Um, and they would have people in period clothing wear, uh, uh, do their living history thing. And, and their most memorable thing is they have a full working railroad called the Huckleberry Railroad. And it's got the locomotive, everything, and you ride on the train and uh, it gets robbed. Uh, and then they do a gun battle and it's a lot of fun, it really is. But uh, the real big draw here is Christmas at Crossroads. This entire town is made up with just filled with lights and trees and all these really cool things. Um, it's something to see. And when I was a kid, that was a staple of childhood was coming to Christmas at Crossroads. Um, and uh, they even have an opera house right here in this big building with a full theater in it. I've actually seen plays performed there. Uh, it's just a really neat place. It's multiple streets and uh, I'm certain someone's had to have filmed the Western here because it's literally a complete town. But uh, it's of course closed for the winter and uh, it's just really something neat to see when it's open in the summer. And I'm sure they weren't open last year much, but uh, hopefully they'll make a big comeback for 2022. And maybe even 2021, we'll see. store. That's neat. There's a kitty cat.
like the post office. And looks like they got a whole bunch of gift shop and toys for sale. Kitty cat over there on that porch. Living the dream. This is the ice cream shop for diner. The Village Cafe. This is the train station. board the locomotive and take a tour around the property on an old timey train. It's really awesome. It's set up just like an old town would have been. A locomotive right on the end of the town. It has at least two or three main streets and then a couple of cross streets. <clears throat> the town of Crossroads. It's really neat. I, I love history, as I've many times declared on my channel. I love things that celebrate history and when it is very historic, especially when they take time to put that great detail into it. And I've been to several Old West style towns that are, you know, the, I guess you could call them all tourist traps, but a lot of them are just facades or they only have, they don't have a lot of detail put into them. And Crossroads is unique in the sense that they literally built an entire town. Um, it's really neat and it's, it's definitely something to see. Highly recommend it. I'm hungry, it's lunchtime, and I'm in Flint, and there's only one place to be. Halo Burger. So if you're in the Flint area and you want a burger, you come to Halo Burger. Halo Burger is a Flint exclusive chain of burger restaurants. They've been here since the 1920s. Um, they have some unique stuff. Not only do they have a lot of just phenomenally tasting burgers, they put olives on a lot of their burgers and also they have these things called Boston Cooler Milkshakes or just the Boston Cooler. So it is Burner's, which is made right here in Michigan, mixed with vanilla ice cream. That simple. It is absolutely fantastic. And being close to Wisconsin, we also have our very own take on cheese curds, which I absolutely love. This is the standard QP combo, quarter pound combo. And uh, comes pretty standard, I think, with just with all the trimmings. Uh, I didn't get with olives on this one. Like I said, they put olives on a lot of their burgers, and I usually like them, but I just wanted to move for them today. But it's a very juicy burger. Mm. Very cheesy. They have really good fries here too. I like these.
So they also serve Flint style Coney dogs. In Flint, Coney dogs are a big deal. There's Coney Islands on pretty much every corner. Lots of different brands of them, Angelo's, Leo's, Genesee Valley, there's tons of them. Um, but Flint style, they all serve one type of Coney dog and that's the Flint style sauce. We'll get more in depth in uh, later reviews on exactly why, but Flint style Coney sauce is a dry meat sauce. That doesn't make it sound appetizing. It's very appetizing. Just because it's dry doesn't mean it's not appetizing. But what I mean is it's not chili. So it's basically a certain kind of seasoned meat put on with mayo, or not mayo, I'm sorry, mustard and onion. And I always add ketchup to mine. But uh, the key to a Flint style Coney will always and forever be the Kogel being a hot dog. Kogels are made here, right here in Flint. They've been made here for 100 years or so. And uh, Kogels meats are just now starting to expand outside of Michigan, but uh, they make phenomenal hot dogs and they have for many generations. But they snap when you bite into them. Mm. Yes, they do. So good. Mm -hmm. Dumber, numbers. Good job on the fries, Halo Burger. Eats and eats. Set to Ready? So, Cole, you ready? Count of three. You're going to say thanks for watching. One, two, three. Thanks for watching. Set streets and eats it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Set streets and eats.